Hello, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host of Fiber Chats. And today my guest is Jane Firth from Alswater Felting Com uh, Art, right? Felt Art, yes. Alswater Felt Art. It's a little bit of a mouthful. <laughs> so tell me about the name. You live in Alswater, right? I do. Well, it's just down there. Oh, so beautiful. So, um, it was the obvious choice of name right uh, i live on in the Ellswater valley and i do felt art right so how did you start like you you decided to do animals like as your subject why animals how did you get into that? well i started with sheep and it makes an awful lot of sense to felt sheep out of sheep's wool and <laughs> even the right wool right. and we have a lot of sheep around here and the iconic Beatrix Potter Herdwick is on my doorstep and I started doing Herdwicks but there are a lot of other sheep and so yeah that's how I ended up doing sheep. Well you, you also do a lot of things about rare breeds and endangered breeds. Yes. Did you start felting and then you discovered that venue or... yeah well i i've been felting a year or two before i joined the rare breed survival trust and i'm sure there is an equivalent in the us as well um i now belong to the cumbria support group of the rare breed survival trust so i'm a part part of the team that does things locally and i thought when i joined well i can't keep sheep but i can do something to try and raise awareness of the ones that we're losing. Mm -hmm. So the Rare Breed Survival Trust started in 1973 and between 1900 and 1973, we lost 75 of our native farm animals in the UK. Since 1973, we haven't lost any. So they're doing really well. And some of them like the Hebridean and the Shetland sheep are now off the danger list. Um, but the, the breeds of sheep in particular that are going are the, what they call the primitives, which tend to be not white. And the wool board likes white because you can dye it. Right. But actually, you know, hand spinners and weavers, and they like the natural colours. And the other thing about the primitives, which come from the Scottish island, you know, the Shetland, the Hebridean, the North Wallaby, there are, there are lots of them. They're very small and butchers like a standard size of sheep for jointing purposes, but actually we should be eating less meat. So a smaller joint of better quality is a good thing. Um, so I, I needle felted the, the, these beautiful small sheep using the right wool. Um, and I, I just decided that the way to help the Rare Breed Survival Trust was to publicise what they were doing through my artwork. Right. And then 10% of my Rare Breed sales goes to the Rare Breed Survival Trust anyway. So they've, they've done a couple of articles on me and um, yeah, and I've been found by people who have other things besides sheep. There's a lady on Guernsey who breeds golden Guernsey goats, which are on the also on the watch list and I've done quite a few golden Guernsey goats for her and I've been contacted by the English goat breeders and I've done some English goats from their photographs and then they bought cards at a discounted rate to sell on for their funds so I do what I can. And you also do hares and red squirrels. Yes, well, I, I, we have red squirrels. Uh, we are very lucky to have red squirrels because most of Britain has been invaded by the grey ones, which are much bigger and push the red ones out. And I photograph them from my studio window. And my greetings cards are in the local village shop. And they said, oh, have you got any red squirrels? And I said, well, no, but I can do some. So I started doing red squirrels. And then I had cards printed in June and I've just ordered a hundred more because they've all gone. And so I do, there's a local group called the Penrith and District Red Squirrel Group and they do a lot to try and preserve the reds and feed the reds and make sure that the greys are kept under control. So, I mean, we have squirrel feeders in our garden and having squirrel feeders is the difference between them having one litter and two in a year. 
So, you know, we do good things for squirrels. Um, and then the hares were just, yeah, I just like hares. And, you know, I'll go out. If you have to go out quite early to spot them. Um, and I just go out and take photographs when I can. You, they're quite difficult to photograph because they run so fast, but um, I do yeah. like doing hares. Yeah, you mentioned somewhere that they're like the fastest breed in Great Britain. <laughs> Uh, they could well be. Yes, they are incredibly fast. They're big too, compared with rabbits. They're huge. Right. Um, so you also like you photographed them first. And I must tell you, when I looked at your account on Instagram, oftentimes like I would scroll and then I see a picture of a pony and I'm like, I'm scrolling and then it hits me like a second later, like there is a second delay when I realize it's not a picture of a pony, it's a felt art. They're so <laughs> realistic. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm going back up. Make them as realistic as possible. Right. But with the rare breeds in particular, um, especially if it's one that I didn't take the photograph, I mean, sometimes I will send my felted picture to somebody who's got those sheep. I mean, I've got an example here. This is something called a white faced woodland. Um, which is a rare breed. I did photograph it myself because there's a lady in the valley who's got some. Um, but I just thought I might as well ask somebody who knows about these to, to check it because I want it to be right. right. Um, and similarly, I mean, this is a the Golden Guernsey goat lady. This is one of her goats. And I, I, I sent her the picture and said, you know, is this all right? And, so, I mean, I, I like to get feedback. And, and the other thing that I need a lot of feedback for is commissions. I mean, I did a, um, a dog for somebody and she, she didn't have that many photographs and the dog had died. So, you know, there was a lot of toing and froing because it needed to be absolutely right. But, I'd never met the dog. So um, we got there in the end, but it did take <laughs> Right. Well, but how did you get into felting to start with? Well, I mean, I've always done craft of some sort and I love wool and we have, I don't know if you have them in the US, but knit and natter groups. So just a group of local ladies who get together just to do things. And one of the ladies had a friend who did wet felting and she said, oh, well, she's going to come and show us all how to do wet felting. So. I took a picture of a herdwick and I did a herdwick and, and that was wet felting and that was the, that was the first time I'd properly done felting. Um, but the thing about wet felting is that in the process of felting it, everything moves. So it's very difficult to get the detail. Right. Um, I still do use wet felting because I will wet felt big pieces in lots of different colours. So I'll, I'll do a white and a grey and a black and a brown and so that I've then got the a piece to cut my basic shapes out of. So here we are, here's a, here's a herdwig. So I've cut the basic shape of the face out in white and I've cut the basic shape of the horn out in a gray color. And so then I, then I build it up after that. Right, so when you make the pictures, there is the background and then there are horns that's sort of yeah. Like well, yes, so, right? so I do. I do the face first, um, and the horns and the ears, and, and then I do the background, and then I put the face and the horns on top of the background, and then then the woolly bit goes in last. So um, so that is herdwick wool on a herdwick, and and that you know that it's it's just been washed and it's sort of partially felted at the bases anyway. So that's why it looks so realistic because it is straight off the sheep. I bet it's clean. Right. Um, I was talking to uh, Andy Ross, who is the owner of uh, Shetland Tweed Company in Shetland. Oh, yes. And he was complaining to me, well, not complaining, but like sharing his frustration that when he would take a picture, like all the flowers and grass and like the background sort of lost that detail. And I feel like you with the felting as sort of like in the position where you can put all the details that your eye can see that the photograph yeah. not necessarily catching. How do you like decide on the background? Because your background is just like 
so eye-catching i don't even like when i'm looking at the picture i don't know what catches my eye first the animal or the background okay um i there's a local lady who dyes blue face lester wool um in beautiful colors and i'll give you, tell you this one this is so this this color at the bottom all of that is what she calls her Blencathra mix. And Blencathra is a local mountain. So you have got the heather uh, and the green of the bracken and, and then there's sort of mountains. And, um, and then she, I use her, her sky colors as well. So I, she lives lots of blues and grays and things. Um, so I, I, I use her colors, but I, I, I blend them in different ways. Um, but I, I look at the colour of the animal I'm doing and I'm looking for a contrast. Um, and well, I suppose that, yeah, I don't know that there's a um, particular rhyme or reason behind the colours, except that I want contrast and I want it to look sort of semi-natural. So you went over, you took a list of all the endangered breeds and you yes. just went like one by one, basically, like working well, your way through. Well, I, the sheep were, were quite easy to do because, um, you know, I was, I was practiced at doing sheep, but I did try and get the right wool. And there were about 25 or 26 of them, so there were quite a lot. And then having done them, there were only two goats. So I thought, well, that's easy. I'll do the two goats. There are now four. So um, since then, I've done... Um, I've done the goats as well. So the one was the Golden Guernsey, which I showed you. And then there is the, that's an English goat. And then that is an old English goat. So they've, they've been added recently to the list. So, um, and when they were added, I just thought, well, I've got to do them. So, um, but um, the English Goat Breeders Association sent me photographs. So that was, that was quite helpful because there aren't any around here. Um, so that's how I, that's how I ended up doing goats. Um, then there is a native pony called the fell pony and they're up, there's a herd of them just the other side of the lake and I love photographing those. So that's how I ended up doing ponies. I did um, quite a few fell ponies and I recently took part in a local exhibition all about fell ponies and they invited me to take part and then they would take some commission if they sold anything. So. That was fine. That was good. Uh, and of course, they sent me photographs, too. So um, they were better photographs than I've taken of the ones nearby because they're breeders and then they, they know the ponies well and they can take better photographs. Um, and because I'd done fell ponies, I then started working my way through the ponies on the list as well. So I this is an Exmoor pony. Um, she's, there we are. Makes more pony, and actually, that is on the mug that I'm drinking out of too. Um, so that um, I haven't finished the ponies. There are quite a few of them, uh, and I've done very few of the cows and no pigs. So, <laughs> so I, there's I still still like a lot go. of right. There is a yeah, long no, way. No, I don't know about pigs because you see, with hares, cows, um, ponies, squirrels, I use alpaca fiber and not wool because you don't want the crimp. Right. It needs to be straight and it needs to look like fur. So um, I do use wool to hold the alpaca in because it doesn't felt as well as wool. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a mixture. As a neither, I have a stash. <laughs> How big is your stash? <laughs> That's where I'm going with that. How big is your stash of wool how do you buy wool? Like, do you have a certain project in mind when you buy wool or do you just buy and then you like, when you come up with the project, you go to your stash and you see what's going to strike a chord? Like, how do you? Well, approach? I mean, at shearing time, I do look out for particular fleeces. So I bought several Herdwick fleeces um, because with a Herdwick, um, they come in all shades from very dark grey to almost white but to contrast with the white face I quite like using a dark gray right. and I'd only got a very pale gray left so I I bought several um 
And then and people do offer them to me. So I was at a craft event earlier in July and somebody came up to me with a big bag and said, I've got a Hebridean fleece, would you like it? So, so I bought that. And then the other thing was that there was a lady who bred Herdwick sheep and she'd got um, a fleece off a, off a Herdwick that was only a year old. And so they go from being black to being dark brown, to being gray, to, to becoming almost white. And this was nearly black, which is quite unusual for one that's been its first shearing because often it's brown by then. Right. So, she she had just had it for display she wasn't even going to sell it and I said can I have that and so she waited until the end of the day and then I bought it and I took it home so I bought quite a lot of Herdwick this year um I I am thinking of dyeing my own soon um because I've got so much wool that's just white um that I don't need it all and um so I'm going to experiment with background colors is there other crafts that you do besides felting? Oh, yeah, well, I knit, um, I sew. Um, I have done a lot over the years. I mean, we lived in Hong Kong for four years and I did a course in Chinese brush painting. Um, and I've done a lot, quite a lot of silk painting because when we lived in Hong Kong, raw silk was easy to buy. And so I did a lot of silk painting. Um, I have done oils, but um, yeah, I think one one is enough. I do knit for my grandchildren, but I don't knit anything else at the moment. Right. Do you, so when you like decide what to do next, is it always systematical? Like you go down the list of ponies, you go down the list of goats? No, no, it's not systematic. Um, last Wednesday, I went to um, a big agricultural show to help man the Rare Breed Survival Trust stand. And there were two of us, and when it was quiet, we just had to walk around. And um, I took a fabulous photograph of a really handsome Herdwick tup, and he was just asking to be felted. So. <laughs> Yes, I, I've started him. Uh, what else did I take? Uh, I took a few others that are just really good, really nice photographs because you've got to start with a good photograph. Right. If your photograph isn't good to begin with, and sometimes this photograph is just saying, felt me, felt me. So that's no, what there, there is one picture on your Instagram where there is a baby cow. And then the next picture up is that felted baby cow. And I was like, oh my God, it just like it looked absolutely identical. Oh, I don't remember that. Okay. <laughs> I'll put them here. <laughs> okay. How long does it take you to like from start to finish on average to do a felting of like the size? Well, that, that, that is a tricky one because I don't do it all in one go. So, you know, if it's a wet day and I really need some wet felt, I will spend all morning just making wet felt. So, so that is my the, my pieces that I'm going to cut out. So I'll so I, like I said, I've got, I do lots of different colours, and because it's quite messy and it completely takes over the kitchen, I do a lot in one go. But then that'll last me several months. So I mean, it's a big job, but I don't do it that often. Um, now, if it's a Herdwick, and in particular a Herdwick that I've done before it will not take me anything like as long as doing a sheep from a photograph that I haven't done before and I don't know the breed or a commission. The commissions take the longest. Right. Um, so I, do, I don't sit down and do it all in one go. So I, I can't tell you the answer to that. And, it, and of course it, it, it does vary quite a lot. Right. How does your family, um look at all that stuff like when you have when you come back home with another two bags of fleas or <laughs> <laughs> you know is there like ever like when is enough enough like is are they being very supportive about it no no no, no. they're very supportive and, and my husband does the photography for the greetings cards as well because he's got a really good camera um and he's also very neat when it comes to taping the back so I do a lot of framing myself and I've got a mat cutter and which has been absolutely brilliant um but he's 
he's a perfectionist and when it comes to do it you know the tape around the back of the frame he does it absolutely beautifully so um so he does that um yeah he, he's very supportive actually right i mean it's very important he's also absolutely brilliant at looking at my the photograph and the picture side by side with fresh eyes and saying mm, you that eye's too small or you know something like that because I've been sitting over it for hours and he comes to it fresh and and sees things that I don't see right when so, you, when you look at the paintings you've done um I mean I don't even know like can you call them paintings because they're not paint but like the felt art I paint you... with wool right <laughs> it looks like that so when you look at them at the at the first ones that you've done in comparison to where you now, how did oh. you change? Oh, I have to delete them. They're horrible. <laughs> yeah, they. I've got better, and and I've because I've not been doing it that long. I'm still getting better. So, um, but the other thing about needle felting and um, what I do is that you can actually take it apart. So, if I've got one that it was quite a nice picture, but there's things I want to change, I can just take it apart. And sometimes I will take it by, right back to the bare bones and sometimes I will just redo the eye or something because you could do that. Do you feel like you being a perfectionist at that? That like how, when do you stop yourself at? That's a really <laughs> tricky one because I sent off a new greetings card order today and there were some that, we were absolutely sure that these were the ones we wanted. When it came to Herbert Rams, you know, there were so many to choose from and every one of them had something wrong with it. And so anyway, we got there in the end, but um, yeah, um, but then I need to go back to the ones with something wrong with them and put it right. Right. So when you first started, was it difficult for you to find the audience for your for your craft, or was it so unique that people like right the way took to it? Well, I the, the reason I needed a website is because I was putting them on Twitter. I started with Twitter, and a lady in Germany who'd got blue face testers. Oh, I can show you what blue face testers. They, they are really quite weird looking sheep. Um, said, "Could I do a commission of?" her it was her tup which is a ram and and one of it one of the lambs together and of course I'd never done a commission I didn't tell her I'd never done a commission but I said yes and I did it um and that's when I thought well I, I need to move beyond twitter and have a website um but until the pub at the bottom of my road started selling them and this is a tourist area this is the English Lake District and the pub is on a main drive-through road so it gets a lot of passing traffic until they started selling my pictures I had 100% export because it was all through Twitter right um and now I sell far more in this country than I do overseas but they still go overseas so you do pictures and then you do greeting cards also well, yes, because, I mean, if you're at a craft event and everything is over a hundred pounds, you aren't going to sell very much. Right. Um, where, but the greetings cards, I mean, I started with only six designs and I've now got over 40 and they, they started slowly, but I know I, I had 500 printed in June and they've all gone. So, but they are now in local shops as well as me selling them independently so um yeah that's good um because since i started selling greetings cards i'm now up to having sold over 2000 and every one of them has got my name and my website on the back right so you know people might buy them because they know so and so likes sheep and then so and so likes sheep or might go onto my website and buy somebody a birthday present you know it happens like that and often with craft events somebody will just pick up a business card or they've seen something in an exhibition and then six months later they'll come back and buy something for somebody for Christmas. Has COVID affected your business side as well? Yes, it did because 
last year and this year there have been virtually no craft events and no agricultural shows right so i mean the agricultural shows i would just enter the felting class you know put a, just put a couple of pictures in and sometimes those would go and uh, there's been one agricultural show that i've been to and i think one craft event this year there was nothing last year and and you know really, i really miss that and the other thing about the craft event is that i'm sitting there needle felting all day and so i talk to everybody who comes through about what i do and why i'm doing it and how i do it and so that i mean it's that one-to-one -one contact that, that I, it's just not there with um, anything online I've, I've done a few online events but they've not been great no. Have you done any classes? Have you taught any classes about felting? No. I think every event I go to, somebody says, do you do classes? Um, no, I did talk to my local WI and I just, I, I created a slideshow that's similar to the one on my Facebook page. Um, and, but I brought not everybody a piece of foam and a piece of background and a needle and a bag of wool and it was more about them having a go right. than me telling them how to do it. So um, so that was quite good fun, but I haven't done it since. But they, they, I mean, this was a really sort of forgiving audience because I knew most of them. And um, so, yeah, it's a tricky one because you wouldn't want too many people because it's, well, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's quite. If you haven't, if you've never done it before, I mean, the first thing you've got to do is be a, is hold the needle properly, right. because one of the one of these ladies at WI won't, won't, broke about three or four needles in quick succession because she was putting it in at an angle rather than straight up and down. But I gave her a holder, a wooden thing to put the needle in, and I mean, she was quite elderly anyway, and she found that helped, so that was fine after that. Right. Weren't you an educator in your pre-felting life? Yes, yes, I, I've been a teacher for many years. And you don't think like you would be natural at teaching felting? Oh, well, yes, probably. Um, yes. Um, yeah, I possibly, but I, I, haven't, I haven't done it yet. And then there's, there's still COVID, so um, not yet. There's always YouTube tutorials. <laughs> There is YouTube, but I, I, there's loads of people who've done that already. You know, if you want to know how do you make whiskers on a hair, you put it, you type it into YouTube and somebody's done it. Right. Have people tell you that like they've never seen stuff like yours before? Like the people in awe of like when they see your- Oh, what, what is lovely. I mean, I've been doing craft event each weekend for the last few weeks and, and it's the way people's faces light up when they come through the door. I mean, that's lovely. Um, there are other people doing similar things, but um, it's, I think it's the rare breed connection that is unique. Right. Are you a good artist in general? Because like to depict that level of uh, likeness, I feel like you have to be a painter before anything. Like, are you amazing at drawing? No, not amazing at drawing. I, I mean, I have done all sorts, um, but I, I just like using wool as my medium. Don't, I don't draw anything first. Um, and when it comes to, you know, I mean, I, I put the eye in place and I put the nose in place and I've marked where the ear is going to go and, and then just sort of fill it in. What do you find the most difficult part of an animal to create oh it's always the eye and i tend to do the eye first and i often end up redoing it at the end but if the eye is what gives it character right do you ever find that that pe like you would sell a painting and people is there like ever any negative feedback do you ever get any critique of your work no I haven't I, the comments that I get when I send things are usually you know lovely um, I'm also quite good at packing things up and sending them quickly so you know, like somebody says oh well it's my my wife's birthday on Thursday and can you get it to me on Thursday and is it framed and you know so usually I can do that um, so 
and and greetings cards too I you know I, I had an order this morning and I packed them up and she'll get them tomorrow the next day so right the is there like a favorite part of business for you oh I am not a business woman I'm an artist but I know you have to do both um I have had to learn about social media and I have had to learn about picture frame because if I took every picture to a local framers, it would be more than double in price. Right. Um, but, you know, they're just things I've had to learn. Um, but I, I don't advertise, advertise. I just put things on social media and that's how I get found. Do you ever feel like you have to decide what's going to sell versus what you really want to do y yes i have made mistakes with the greetings cards so i picked some designs where i think that is really nice. i really like that one and they've not gone um whereas last june we clearly got it right because they're nearly all gone um so instead of ordering 50 of each, the next batch will be 100 of each of some of the very same cards. So yes, I do make mistakes. And I am one of the ones, you know, that this Exmoor pony is my husband's all time favorite picture. And we had it made into greetings cards and I think somebody bought 10, but I haven't sold many more than that. Um, so yes, I, de I definitely make mistakes with greetings cards. Um, Herdwicks I do do regularly because they sell regularly. Um, and other things, I mean, it, the, the rare breed things, it tends to be the cards rather than the actual pictures. Have you ever uh, considered like making different items? I don't know, like closing of bags or book covers or anything at all? Well, I will tell you a funny story because my first Christmas card that I did was a Kerry Hill and they are quite striking sheep. They have got white faces with black eyes and a black nose and black ears. And I thought, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a Santa hat and a pair of bauble earrings on this picture and make it into a Christmas card. And somebody from the Kerry Hill Sheep Breeders Association said, oh, well, I absolutely love these. Can you make me Christmas tree decorations that are just like your greetings card? Right. So I said, yes. And they were so fiddly. So they were really small. And so you had to make two Kerry Hills that were mirror, mirror, mirror images of each other and stick them together. And then you had to put the hat on and then you had to put, make earrings for them. And <laughs> it was so fiddly. And I wasn't that pleased with the result. And I couldn't possibly charge her the amount of money that they warranted given the time they took. Right. So she said, well, you know, if I tell everybody in the sheep in the Kerry Hill Sheep Breeders Association about these, you'll have loads of orders. And I said, this is a one off. <laughs> I am not making any more. Um, so, yeah, I have only done Kerry Hill Christmas tree decorations once. And I also said, well, if you've got either small children or cats, you're going to have to put them right at the top of the tree because they'll demolish them very quickly. Right. <laughs> now, my pictures go behind glass, you see. And you can't do that with a Christmas tree decoration. So um, yeah, um, so that that was my only foray into something other than pictures. Do you find it hard to say no to people like when for commissions you don't feel like doing or or anything? Uh, no, I I well my my attitude to commissions is that they've got to be happy with it. So. You know, if if at the end I don't charge any more for my commissions than I do for a picture normally, and it'll take me a lot longer, but every piece is a learning experience. I mean, like this dog I did, I, I hadn't done a dog before, and it actually turned out really well, and I was very pleased with it. But um, that's you know, there's no guarantee that that is the case. And if you know, I've got one photograph and the person whose animal it is knows it intimately. And if they're not happy with it, then, you know, I, 
Um, it's probably not a um, business-like way of approaching commissions, but um, I, I need happy customers. So have that happen like a lot? Has anybody not liked it? No, <laughs> no. Um, so the lady with the dog was very pleased with it. And then there was another lady who, um, I'd have done a few recently, actually. There was another, um, another lady who sent me the wool from her sheep to make her sheep. And yeah, there was a bit of toing and froing because it was a quite a weird looking sheep as well. And it had these great big ears and she, she sent them back and said, I don't think the ears are big enough. And I said, that's fine, I'll take them off and do them again. <laughs> um, but the problem with that one is that the wool she sent me was absolutely filthy. And I spent hours and hours and hours and hours washing this wool. So I decided that the next time I make a wool out, a sheep out of its own wool, I'm going to have to say the wool's got to be clean. Right. Because I mean, I, I guess that's part of the I've learning. I've already given that. her a price. Right. And, and this just wasn't fair that the wool was so dirty. And I had another one where the lady had, I mean, when you've got a ram, you have to, you know, you keep it for a couple of years and then you can't keep it any longer because it, it can't mate with its offspring. So you get rid of it. And the lady who had a, had a Borore ram and she absolutely loved it and she had to sell it. And, and then the person who bought it just put it in a field on its own and they're social animals. And it just went round and round and round and round until it died. And she was so upset. And, and so I did him. And uh, I actually did two because I did one face on and one was a sort of three quarter view. And um, and she was so pleased. She said, you know, my Mars is looking at me from the, because he was called Mars, <laughs> looking at me from the wall. And so, I mean, it's nice when I can do that. Have you ever considered doing like endangered species other than domesticated breeds? Um, well, yes, the hares and the squirrels are not. Are, um, right, that's true. <laughs> yes, now I have done, where is it? Oh, yeah, my first, I mean, they're not endangered, but I just really fancied this. It's a fallow deer, and I've not done deer before. And But one of the things about animals with big horns is that you can't do, if you're going to fit it into anything, you can't make the face that big because you've got to fit the horns on. So... When I said, oh, that one doesn't have any horns at all because it's female. And I thought, hmm, I really fancy doing that. So I, I mean, deer with these huge great antlers are quite striking, but then I'd have to make a huge picture to make the, the face any sort of decent size. So that's why I've not done it. Have you ever done like anything larger than what you just showed? Do you, or you have like standard the size? The biggest ones, are about 40 by 40 centimeters so um i tend to work to a standard size of picture frame right at the beginning i didn't and then of course you have trouble framing it so um do you have any dream of like one day disregarding like how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take to create something like enormous. Oh, well, the trouble is, is it's backing it and stretching it. And, you know, because somebody did ask me if I could do a bed head that was, I mean, it was huge and she just fancied having lots and lots of sheep on it. And I said, well, first of all, you're going to have to cover it with something because otherwise, you know, it's just going to wear away. But then when I said how much one sheep was and she wanted lots, I think she just decided that it wasn't a practical idea. But I mean, right. you, you'd have to put it behind glass and you don't really want that on your bed head. So, um, so it was an interesting idea, but it didn't go anywhere. Right. Uh, what are you working on now? What am I working on? I am I'm doing Herdwicks at the moment because... Um, I sold two last week and two others went into an exhibition and they are the most popular around here because they're such iconic animals. Do you know what I mean by a herd with? Yeah. I mean, their wool is as coarse as coarse because they survive up on the fells, but they have the most gorgeous smiley faces and the tops have really great big horns. So they're lovely animals. Right. And, right. and they are classic Lake District and that's where I live. 
do you ever feel like you don't want to repeat what you already have done oh absolutely so i uh, this photograph that I took of the Herdwick Ram at the Western Show last Wednesday, I decided that I'm going to do him. Um, but you see, I, I'm always out with my camera. I take my camera everywhere I go. And so I, I, I might unexpectedly take a really nice photograph that I've got to film that one. Um, so all my Herdwicks are labelled by where I took the photograph. Right. And I might do the same one a couple of times, but then I'll find another photograph I like and I don't do any more. But even if I do it twice, it's not the same. Have you ever wondered, like, if you put all those people together, this holding your painting that you sold, how long that line would be? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> My husband asked me that. So how many pictures have you sold since you started? I don't know. I know how many cards I've sold because I've got a record sheet because I need to keep tabs on how many I've got left. Um, but how many pictures? I, I mean, I could probably find out, but um, a lot. <laughs> well, thank you so very much. I really can't wait to see what else you're going to do. And every time your picture pops on my Instagram feed, I'm stopping and I'm taking a look and I'm like studying what I'm seeing. And I will absolutely love your account. I'm going to put the link to your account and hopefully it'll introduce you to my followers and maybe somebody okay. else is going to discover you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for being my guest today. I really enjoyed getting to know you. My pleasure.